All right, well, welcome everybody to an introduction to why breathable wall systems. Uh, this course is approved in one hour continuing education units GBCI, AIA, HSW, um, NARI Green, uh, Certified Green Home Professionals, AIBD, and may be applicable to your local um, or state based uh, design uh, contractor needs. Um, I'll be your moderator today. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director at the Green Home Institute. Green Home Institute is a uh, nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Um, we can also help you if you're looking to get uh, green certification on your next project. All right, with that, I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, George Paul Swanson. Uh, George received a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Technology from Western Washington University in June 1975. Since that time, he has worked through the Pacific Northwest, the Great Plains, and the Southern United States, designing, building, and managing the construction of homes and commercial, commercial buildings. In 1981, he published the best-selling Dome scrapbook, culminating his experience of designing and participating in building more than 300 geodesic dome structures in the Pacific Northwest between 1974 and 1981. Over the years, Swanson and Associates have completed over 80 low toxic and fully non-toxic breathing natural building projects in 11 states and several foreign countries. Since 1975, he has conducted hundreds of seminars across the country and abroad on the benefits of natural building design, and we're very thankful to have him joining us today. So with that, George, uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Brad. And um, yeah, we're finding more and more the interest in this topic is finally peaking, you know, and of course, we know in America, it's, it's more difficult than other places to find materials that fully meet this criteria, what we might call the building biology criteria. And that means materials that, um, of course, are naturally sourced that don't contain the toxins that are common to all our building materials in America and um, are long-lasting and self-dehydrate and, of course, are not conductive for EMFs. So, um, you know, our experience has been with folks primarily with chemical sensitivities, and that group is growing by over 40% a year, um, and it's still largely not di diagnosed at all. And most people don't understand, you know, the depth of what's going on, you know, with these materials. That a full 85% of all the materials at Home Depot are based on the utilization of the waste products of the production of petroleum. And, of course, didn't even exist 110 years ago. And what we found is in, in just pure trial and error over many, many years of working with folks with these severe sensitivities is uh, we simply have this large group of people that can't be near plywood, OSB, drywall, and in some cases, Portland cement. And that same group tends to be also quite sensitive to EMFs and EMPs, you know, radiation from the sun and from man-made cell towers specifically. And uh, finding materials that can block these affordably that are non-disruptive has been an incredible challenge. Over the years, my own introduction to, especially to the magnesium products, was through uh, Fazwall and Durasol, the clay magnesium treated wood chip blocks out of Europe, you know, with a good 300 year history in Europe. Um, very well proven technology that flowered after World War II using a lot of the rubble from the um, bombed out buildings into these lightweight um, wood chip blocks that simply treated the wood with magnesium oxide and fine clays. Uh, very, very old technology. And of course, then we found out that in <laughs> China has gone back a full 5,000 years. And in India, this technology goes back a full 9,000 years. So absolutely nothing new about it. It uh, was the world's concrete before Portland cement typically uses one-tenth to 150 energy to produce in Portland cement. And we can easily achieve, you know, up to 12 times the strength. 
So I got extremely interested in how that could apply to modern construction without disrupting the way we commonly build in America, that is, with sticks and sheets. And it took quite a few years to get there to where we feel we can now present these sheeting materials as full replacements for plywood, OSB, and drywall, the three main moisture trapping offenders that are common to all our building technology in America and uh, the ones we're in the most denial about. <laughs> but we work with folks who simply have, simply have no choice. They simply had to get those materials off their building. But for all of us, it means what we're paying in terms of the short lifespan of these materials and, of course, the toxic radiation, which is highly amplified by these materials all being moisture trapping. And that whole moisture trapping phenomenon is kind of the definition of breathing wall, how we address the science of how moisture, um, you know, affects a building envelope and what it takes to create the right electromagnetic charges that create this balanced push-pull that can convert moisture into vapor. So a full, you know, all good 40, 50 pages of our, our book, Breathing Walls book, just goes into the pure science of converting moisture into vapor, kind of the, uh, you know, the, the juggler vein <laughs> of why a material can last and have competencies that um, turns out our great-grandparents knew a whole lot more about than we do, or what we think is our choices today with all the petroleum-based uh, materials that in almost every case are trapping moisture and amplifying you know, all our building problems. Um, wet things become highly conductive and they're, they don't insulate when they're damp. And of course, you know, we're all seeing the indoor air quality issues related to these sheeting products. And uh, so, you know, it was an imperative that we find ways of addressing these issues and um, you know, we had to really, really look deep, deep into the past to find that these were not common long-term problems. I've been very fortunate to be hired by the Chinese government for the largest part of the largest restoration program in world history, the restoration of the temples and monasteries in China, where they simply don't allow most of our Western materials to touch those buildings. And they have gigantic, uh, really a huge effort going on to restore the ancient mineral technologies that uh, simply didn't mold and didn't create these incredible, you know, problems we're seeing with the modern building envelopes. So I guess we could kind of proceed with the slides. Uh, uh, and uh, we can also field questions as we're going along. So our first one here is, in an ideal sustainable world, what would we expect from our building materials? Extreme durability, longevity, resource use, manufacturing, health and safety, and environmental impacts. And on those scores, you know, the only reason our, you know, petroleum and forest product industry exists is because both energy and wood products were extremely inexpensive at one time. That does not exist today, but we kept those industries going primarily with lawyers and and uh, lobbyists, you know, that do pretty much mask the real environmental costs of these uh, materials that uh, are causing these incredible problems. We've deferred the medical costs to other professions and the replacement costs to uh, long-term or short-term accounting that doesn't really reflect, you know, the real cost of those uh, damaging materials. But, uh, okay, we'll, we'll go to the next slide here. Okay, so we'll just go through a brief history of the use of these ancient magnesium cements in the terracotta soldiers in China, and of course, Great Wall, the Pantheon in Rome, and the official discovery, modern yeah, the history of magnesium oxide cements. And so we're just going to go through uh, uh, some quick slides on um, the Terracotta Army of China, the Great Wall of China, the Pantheon in Rome, 
and the official discovery of magnesium, the modern scientific discovery of magnesium oxide, and then its current uses. And, you know, and feel free to ask questions as, as we go. Now, can people see this slide now? It just says chapter one on the top. Yeah, so it was just, you, we just lost your sound, but the slides are, are working just fine. Oh, okay. So we'll go to the next one. Yeah, just a little bit about the terracotta army. It's not terracotta, it's all magnesium cement. Um, where most of this was mined, of course, is from what's called the Great White Mountains of China. And they're called that not because the, of the snow, but it, they dig six inches down and there's solid magnesium oxide. And of course, the Great Wall is along, you know, um, over 2,000 miles of these, this 3,000 mile mountain range is solid magnesium oxide. So, you know, you might guess what they used to build the wall. You know, they, they weren't waiting for the Portland cement truck. And of course, you'll see an upcoming slide where uh, this stuff doesn't rot over time. The rocks on the walls in some areas are completely rotted out with the uh, mortar in perfect condition. And uh, of course, you know, these, these soldiers were buried for over, some of them for over a thousand years with no damage. So yes, and you see over to the right-hand side of this slide where, you know, the uh, bricks, you know, had completely rotted out and the ancient mortar, you know, is still in, um, in good condition about 800 years later on this particular part of the wall. So uh, th this material, of course, is completely common everywhere in China, and we'll see that um, coming up, you know, the, how it's being adapted to the modern uses. And we'll go to the next slide here. Ah, why? Okay, here we go, the Pantheon. These pro prozolanas, they're used for the cements for many Roman buildings, contains large amounts of magnesium oxide and um, other metal oxides, of course. And this was built right near Magnesia, Rome. Uh, the volcanoes had actually done a whole bunch of the uh, uh, cooking it down. For, for them, much the same way as we do with kilns today. So it was oxidized, you know, through the volcanoes. And uh, the modern discovery, um, you know, this really just was at first just called Epsom salt. And, uh, you know, at first there is very little that people knew what to do with it, but they had known that in the Asian cultures, it had already been, you know, used for multiple thousands of years. And we'll go to this next one. Okay, here we go. Pre-Portland cement in America. The base of the Brooklyn Bridge is made from locally cement uh, called uh, Rosedale natural cement that is uh, 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 calcium and magnesium oxide. Um, and it's the only natural non-fired cement made in America. And the trazzle floors of the 18th and 19th century were all MGO-based cement. And we saw, I had done some work in uh, Sarasota, Florida, where it had been used all the way up to the mid-50s. It was the base for all the uh, terrazzo work. And they were even casting uh, roofs with it because it was non-cracking and had you know, much, much higher flexibility than Portland cement. And the current uses, um, Taipei 101 was one of the very first uh, local tall buildings to be fully sheeted with it. Now um, the five largest buildings in the world are actually sheeted with this material inside and out, ceiling floors, fireproof, moldproof, bugproof with nothing added to it. No biocides, no fire retardants required. And we all ask, why can't we, why isn't this common in America? Well, we'll get to that a little bit later. And uh, the Olympics, in the 2008 Olympics, used over 8 million square feet of MGO sheeting. And we always point out that even in America, the largest construction project completed in 2013, the rebuilding of the Las Vegas city center used over 16 million square feet of MGO board 
primarily because it was financed over 70% by Saudi Arabia that said, you're going to have a three and a half hour burn rating on every floor of those buildings or you don't get your money. <laughs> it was kind of simple. And in Saudi Arabia, it's the only sheeting material that's been used for the last 12 years. So when we see all those gorgeous brushed titanium buildings, they're like 60, 70 micron of titanium or chromium brushed onto the MGO board to deal with the hot sun and the uh, you know harsh desert conditions. So worldwide, it's you know it's a multi multi billion dollar industry. So we'll go next. And uh, the chemical properties, we'll go a little bit into, the, you know, the raw materials and the processes and the science and the real, real interesting link called the con concrete rainforest, going into the deep science of what happened on the CO2 formula with these materials as opposed to the um, modern cement. It's the eighth most abundant element on Earth. It's about 2% of the Earth's crust, and is the third most plentiful element dissolved in seawater. So it's found in over 60 minerals, and um, the common ones are dolomite and um, magnesite and butite, and um, can be mined and processed, you know, typically at 600 degrees for 10 minutes as opposed to Portland cement, which is, you know, over 2,000 degrees for eight hours. So it's just way, way lighter on the energy formula. And uh, we'll go next slide. And uh, this just shows some of the reserves worldwide. China, of course, has the largest reserves. A lot of the, you know, uh, reserves in America are going to be revised soon, and they're expecting those to be close to double on the, the next big assay that will be coming out on world's reserves. So we're not going to run out. It's kind of like building a home out of earth. You know, you don't have to feel like really guilty about, you know, using up some earth. Who is that the company in uh, yeah. Michigan that it mentioned? I have to, I have to chime in because I saw the word Michigan. I have no choice. That's where I am. Oh. What, yeah, uh, who is that company, company in, in Michigan? Michigan? Yeah. Well, let's see. Okay. Go back. And uh, we're getting all our raw material for this out of um, uh, now. Uh, okay. Where did you find that? Well, maybe. Oh, it was on the last slide. Uh, and it mentioned, it saw the word Michigan at the top there. Um, two companies that, uh, in Michigan. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Some of the locations. Yeah, uh -huh. it turned out in the early 40s, there were 16 major mines that were producing magnesium oxide for cement. And each one, of, and it turns out, you know, it was being used everywhere. It was used for stucco, they were making window frames, window yeah. tiles, um, roof tiles, everything imaginable was made for it up to the mid 40s. And then in the early 50s, the Portland cement people systematically put every one of these natural cement guys into bankruptcy. So there's only a couple that were left. We got to talk to the last of those guys a few years ago, and they're, and they're all dead now. They said, you know, it's really criminal what happened. They go into an area, the Portland folks who, by the way, were financed by the same wonderful European families that gave us the Federal Reserve Board <laughs> a year later gave us the Portland Cement Association. And uh, there's an incredible dark history about why you haven't heard about this material. But it's only in North America that this isn't happening in a, you know, really, really huge scale. Uh, China has virtually banned the use of our plywood, our OSB, and our gypsum-based drywall. Formerly, it was made illegal 11 years ago. Tons of it are still in the black market all over China, you know, because they make, you know, overruns for all their Western clients. But that's what rapidly, rapidly changing in China. China does plan on reverting back to this concrete. They have multiple thousands of years history of it. And obviously now they've seen the <laughs> results of uh, America transferring so much of our pollution of our petroleum-based products to their country, you know, with incredible detrimental effects that are not part of China's future. And it has everything to do with their new private banking and what it will take, you know, to 
to break the petroleum-based um, industries that now dominate China as well. But the pollution resultant of that is, is not a tolerable future for that country. And we brag about our air getting cleaner year after year, and uh, I actually have a home in the Himalayas, and uh, you know the effects are creeping up the side of the mountains at this point. It, it's way, way beyond what anybody had imagined in terms of the true resultant of having an economy based on utilization of, you know, the waste products of the production of petroleum that simply doesn't have a future. And, of course, in America, we defend those products as if they're permanent. <laughs> and, of course, they're not. You know, they, they're massive change, you know, it's about to happen on all that. But uh, it is so much tied into the main question I used to get when I did a lot of public lecturing on this, is if this was so important, why haven't I heard about it? And yes, you know, in Germany, yes, they have been giving doctorate degrees in this entire study for over 85 years, and not one school formally will teach it in America because it fully condemns over three quarters of all the materials we build with. So it's, it's a major unraveling, and it's usually, you know, too much to get into in a short lecture time, but it does mean, you know, that we do have to be looking at a non carbon-based, the non-petroleum-based future. You know, there is, I mean, we could talk about climate change and all the different issues of why we have to go back to these, you know, carbon or this, you know, material that can absorb CO2 that's a sequester rather than one that can never do that. You know, the modern cement was really an invention to capitalize on 1,400 patents for something nobody else could afford to duplicate. I have a book from uh, uh, Thomas Edison where he was almost put into bankruptcy in designing the first kilns for the Portland Cement Association. It took him six years and 150 people to finally come up with an economical way to make this incredibly complex, energy-intensive Portland cement blend that uh, they knew they could, you know, and um, J.P. Morgan at the time made the comment to Edison of how delighted he was that it was so complex that nobody else could get involved. And, of course, they created a full worldwide, you know, cartel that fully controls all of it. And, uh, you know, we just feel uh, the, you know, it was a lot of innocence. I'm sure no one knew the long-term health effects of what this was going to cause, but now we do know, and we do know that we have to go back to these natural mineral bonding technologies. And I like to refer to this as just one of many, many natural mineral bonding technologies that can apply to all areas of industrialization, that we don't have to start with the carbon and the, you know, waste products of petroleum to create all these binding technologies. And really, if we had to summarize the science of why these minerals are so superior to modern bonding technologies is that they're three-dimensional bonds that form like a double helix that are self-healing that adjust rather than a laboratory-made two-dimensional bond that we make with carbon and with uh, petroleum waste that are like little hinges and only open and close X number of times. So when we read about like acrylics and different materials that are now bragging about how well they can breathe, uh, typically for only one or two years, it's like a hinge that simply wears out and breaks. It can't self-heal like a three-dimensional natural mineral bond. And that's a little bit of what these slides go into, but the book goes, our book goes very, very deep into this about the pure science of just converting moisture into vapor. And we always fall back on the analogy between bone and tissue. The charge between the clay in your bones and the cellulose in your tissue creates a push-pull charge that converts two quarts of water a day into vapor and you're not wet. Disrupt that and you die within two or three days. And we use that as an analogy for how quickly your wall is starting to build up moisture with these materials that were bonded with 
these uh, man-made petroleum uh, materials. They basically they just don't work, you know, because we all ask why our buildings in North America last for 30 years, and I'm working on buildings in Asia, you know, that are eight and nine hundred in good condition. So it, it truly means, you know, a re-evaluation of the value of converting all these waste products into uh, commercial products. But anyway, um, we can talk about this, you know, electrovalent bonding thing, you know, but it really just comes down to can the natural molecular structures of these materials convert moisture into vapor? If they can't, they shouldn't be used for bonding things that are sealing both sides of your walls because the moisture simply has to get back out and it won't get back out and a, a bond that either breaks, like things like Tyvex, you know, can breathe really great for even 10 or 12 years and then quit breathing. And, and of course, our plywood and OSB and drywall are, you know, um, trapping moisture from day one. So, okay, we'll, we'll kind of buzz through some of these slides so we can get into how we apply this in the field, you know, how we can get these into our own homes. But the impacts of global warming on the cement industry, and there's lots of controversy on these figures, but it's, it, you know, it's at least 10 to 12 percent, and it, it got some estimates are as low as 6 percent of the total CO2 emissions worldwide are related to the production, transport, and demolition of Portland cement. So it's an area we can make, you know, a huge, huge impact on. And, and again, right now, and what we'll do at the end of these slides is look at how these are applied to modern materials and how we can make this practical and affordable. But uh, feel free to ask questions as we go as well. Okay, go to the next slide. Hmm. Okay, I've been getting this next page. Here we go. Making MGO versus uh, calcium um, or carbon-based um, cements. And the impacts are pretty profound. You know, when it comes to the amount of energy it takes to produce a pound of the what's called the clinker, the bonding agent in Portland cement, you know, is is well anywhere from you know five to ten times more energy required. Typically, we can oxidize. I was in Turkey recently, where I saw for hundreds of years everybody was making their own magnesium cement in every little village and tiny little kilns, you know, that would cost the equivalent of like $80,000 today to make cement basically a localized process. But even there, you know, the Portland cement industry moved in and put the little guys out of business. But uh, there's a huge movement to get that back. And luckily, China has the opportunity to do it outside of the um, European cartels. But anyway, this, this talks about the concrete rainforest, how the natural cycle of making MGO um, sequesters carbon. And I even have a report from MIT where they propose just creating magnesium, uh, refining magnesium oxide and simply plowing it into the ground to create um, massive carbon sinks. And of course, we, we called them up and said, hey, you know, save it. Let's make buildings out of it. But the shell of our building, you know, can become this massive carbon sink. They've calculated that just by sheeting a building with half inch thick MGO board, you can absorb more CO2 from your building envelope than if you had left the site natural green. And we'll go to the next one here. And uh, if you go to my website, we'll have a link to all these um, slides, but also into the websites of each of the groups that are promoting these natural cements worldwide. And this co shows the, like the net emissions per kilogram of cement, you know, for different um, products like Portland cement 
his magnesia cement and lime and uh, tech cement, which is uh, all these new polymer cements, and then uh, eco cement, and that's a version where they blend uh, calcium with MGO, and then the lime mortars and the enviro cements. So uh, a profound difference in how we could clean up the air in our cities with these uh, natural mineral blends. And uh, alternative materials for stabilization and containment of radioactive materials. And we've been working for years here in Austin with a former NASA physicist who is in charge of the uh, protecting the astronauts on the Apollo program. And uh, that's Dr. James Beale. He's measured, you know, 40 of our homes now uh, with really good, um, just plain old, you know, cell phone protection. You know, basically, you have to go to the windows to use your cell phone inside of a home sheeted with this material. And this is the material just in the half inch or 7 16th version that we use in direct replacement to plywood, OSP, or drywall. And we'll get a little bit into the availability and, uh, you know, the practical uses of that. So we can go into all this bionic bionic binding thing. I'm working with a group that's um, called Bone Solutions that actually finally got their FDA approval for gluing bone to bone, ligaments to ligaments, and ligament to bone with this identical concrete. And um, of course, in Europe, they had been doing this for over 30 years. But uh, whenever you read about a athlete coming back, you know, having a you know broken ankle and being on the court, you know, three weeks two weeks later, it's because they use these natural bonding technology rather than the uh, epoxies that were commonly used in America and still are. And uh, current uses and, of course, the, the high profit industries for magnesium oxide are listed here. Um, even things like fillers for plastics and cosmetics and so it had thousands of industrial uses, but commonly um, the version of the MGO used to make cements, you know, has virtually um, disappeared in the U.S. We still have a Canadian group we work with, Baymag, out of Calgary, that is making a cement version that is now being used in uh, both Canada and the U.S. for the limited production we have of the sheeting materials being made with this. And we'll go into, yeah, the sheeting, you know, got popular in China about 60 years ago. Uh, luckily, they had a long, long history of using this material and, of course, kind of dominate the entire world industry. Over 4,000 groups are producing it in China now. And their long-term plan is to, well, they at least formally have banned our plywood, our OSB and drywall. We even saw in China where even common studs and beams are replaced with multiple layers of the sheeting material with either hemp, um, um, fiberglass, or um, basalt uh, matting to give it the um, tensile strength. And okay, and this is the ceramic cements uh, in the poured version. It's used by different companies doing uh, countertops and um, sinks. We our own company did countertops for years with that. And um, for healing sick buildings, bridges, and teaching Portland cement how to properly breathe. And that means as a coating material, we can even put very fine layers of this and bond this perfectly to Portland and basically create that right charge on the outside of the building so it doesn't attract soot and everything we see that the acrylics do and uh, actually draw, convert moisture into vapor and increase the longevity of even conventional materials. And of course, the paints that are involved with this are now commonly here available, the, the potassium silicates. And um, 
you know, any if you anybody out there who emails, you know, our company, we can send you a whole list of the groups that are selling these uh, paints here in America. Turns out every group that's signed the Kyoto Protocol in 1996 was given till this year, 2016, to eliminate close to 90% of all the paints, stains, stuccos, and caulking sold in America, including all of the zero VOC paints. And we can go into that a little bit later, but you know, suffice it to say, they're fully toxic and um, you know, there's an incredible fraud going on. <laughs> the, the average zero VOC paint in America has over 72 known allergy triggers and up to 110 suspect carcinogenics. None of it printed on a can. There's a reason, you know, all of Europe and I think close to 100 countries that signed, you know, have virtually eliminated those products. And uh, this one goes into the applications uh, as a fireproofing board, as a water mold proofing, as a non-toxic alternative to plywood, OSB, and drywall, uh, as a ceramic cement, as binders and treatments, and stuccos and joint compounds and paints and sealers. And let's see, let's go to the next one here. And as a fireboard, the 7 um, if we put it on both sides of a common stud wall with um, rock wool insulation, they're achieving a three and a half hour burn at, with the 7 sixteenths. And um, the, let's see, they've got it up to a three hour with uh, multiple layers on each side. And uh, anyway, it's, um, you know, it's a way to get an extreme um, fire rating without having to add the toxic fire retardants. And uh, water and mold prevention, uh, simply it won't support mold at all. We have examples of, you know, in China where they dip it in and out of water for over 40 years with zero um, structural deforming and um, no mold, and that's even dipping it in and out of water under different temperature conditions. So we are doing it through doing the sheeting in the stucco has uh, no solvents, no oils, no toxic ingredients, no heavy metals, no asbestos, and no silica. And uh, the treat treating the frame. And we've been doing this for years, treating, basically misting all the wood frames on all our buildings with these blends of these minerals that uh, basically get the wood to dehydrate several times faster by bonding these super fine clays deep into the um, cellular structure of the wood without clogging the pores, without using the plastic powders. And uh, so we can render regular wood fireproof, moldproof, and uh, and uh, bugproof, especially using the fine clays in the same way you would use diatomaceous earth to um, eliminate bugs and rodents, you know, with a, in a least toxic way. Okay, so for health and design, we want to design the wall to breathe, to address all the issues we talked about, sick building syndrome, and uh, of course, for the protection, that would be fire safety and EMF, and to resonate at a natural biological level, the living materials. And that has somewhat to do with kind of the roots of building biology where they went and talked about, you know, the subtle energies you know, we always put it this way, a French cook won't roll out dough on a Portland cement countertop. <laughs> they kind of get it. <laughs> okay, and uh, yeah, the pricing for the MGO board and the raw materials. Uh, currently our company is only representing three of the top uh, MGO board suppliers. So, and we have a total of 12 outlets, you know, nationwide with common pricing to make it practical. 
So without mentioning any actual prices of like a four by eight sheet, it's just uh, very, very competitive to the exterior grade of um, Hardy Board. You know, and it's kind of what Hardy Board wished it was. It actually is waterproof and is fully structural. So its structural ratings per thickness are comparable to OSB and uh, plywood. So we're doing roof sheeting, wall sheeting, one layer direct roofing, one layer direct walls, and one layer direct floors. And that, you know, gets to the area where we can really talk about cost competitiveness. And of course, you know, and it also means anybody that has experience with hardy board can deal with this board. It's the same weight per thickness, same screws, same blades. Um, you know, it's white instead of gray. And we do have, like on a roof sheeting, you know, it's got a full 98% UV reflectivity to create these, you know, of much, much reduced heat buildup in the attics. And of course, here in Austin, you know, we have, you know, several dozen fully finished buildings, including some commercial buildings with it as full roof, wall, and floor sheeting. So with that, you know, we can kind of open everything up to questions on, you know, basically, you know, how to get these products into our own buildings and deal with building departments and, you know, any kind of issues that come up. Great. Uh, thanks, George. Yeah, everybody, um, please start dropping in some of your questions, uh, comments here. And as we're doing that, I just want to go through a couple things. First, I want to say a big thanks to our uh, sponsors who allow us to do what we do, uh, Anderson Windows, uh, Sonic Ventilation, our members, our raiders, our volunteers, uh, presenters, our directors, and then many of you who donate to keep these sessions going. Uh, You still there, Brett? Hear me? Oh, those questions have come in again. Uh, for those of you looking for your CEU, check your email, your spam, uh, for your certificates, um, take the survey. The uh, GBCI number will be coming over to you all shortly in the chat box here once we get to the questions. So look for that, grab that number. And then for those of you watching the recording on demand, so I'm not talking to anyone here today, make sure to complete the 10 question quiz at the end with a 70% passing rate to uh, pick up your continuing end. So I see one question okay. coming in here uh, now, and that question is, let's see here. Can we use as an exterior unfinished sheet cladding without edge spalling? Not fully unfinished. Because it is a breathing porous material, when it, 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 there's no damage from getting it wet. But when it's wet, it's not insulating. And like all wet materials, it becomes a conductor. So we've been finishing it with these highly breathable, you know, potassium silicate paints that are now common here in America. And by the way, they're half the price they were 10 years ago and readily available, and I can send out sheets on exactly how to order those finishes. But a single coat of the potassium mineral, uh, potassium silicate mineral paints will fully finish it. The most common way to use it as an exterior siding is to simply cut strips of it two inches wide and cover your vertical seams and uh, nail or screw heads you know, 16 inch on center uh, directly over just to create like a board and batten look. That's the easiest. We do have several clients that, and myself, you know, where we've fully converted it to uh, a full exterior smooth stucco, you know, beveling the edges, putting in the heavy duty cement board tape and real specialized joint compounds that are, you know, have the same dehydration rate as board. And again, I, I'll send sheets of those out to anybody who simply emails us and, um, you know, where all those things are available. Even Home Depot has a few of these products now. And, uh, uh, yes, you can get a full smooth wall or uh, full textured exterior 
And yes, we have we're using it extensively for roof sheeting and getting some of the cool roof credits. You know, we have a full, you know, 90 some odd percent, you know, UV reflectivity. It is pure white all the way through and has, you know, a structural rating typically high enough for roof sheeting at 7 16th with 16 inch on center rather than, you know, the common 24 because it is, uh, you know, primarily it was designed as a wall sheeting, but now they have specialized versions for both the roof sheeting and the full three quarter inch tongue and groove flooring. And that's the most common commercial use for it is to create, you know, a full, you know, two hour, I think it's two and a half hour rating they got on the three quarter inch board tongue and groove used for floors. And that is pure white. It can be faux finished on the outside, you know, beautifully finished. The top 16th inch of the board is solid, um, pure white ceramic. Then there's layers, up to five layers of fiberglass um, mesh with different, you know, orientations, you know, to create the full structure of a plywood sheet. And all of this is ASTM rated. Um, they even have a, a version for the floor that's rated for 24 inch on center. And those are being actually used extensively in commercial construction. Very, very little in residential at this point. You know, it really comes down to, you know, the builder, you know, yeah. asking yeah. the question, who's paying for the, uh, the learning curve here, <laughs> you know? right? And it, it's much smaller than anybody imagines. You know, we have so many people with experience with Hardy Board and a lot of disappointing experience because it isn't a waterproof product. It has zero structural. It is packed with polymers right. and fire retardants and whatnot over the years to meet different requirements, you know, working exclusively with the petroleum companies to provide those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can and we do. And 90% of my own projects here in Austin are, it's all MGO sheeting inside and out, ceiling and floors, including roof sheeting. And uh, the next question here is a really, really good one. I think there was a, 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 oh. Uh, well, George, there was a follow up to that one, so I wanted to keep it in line. And that was, sure. uh, and, and also as a rain screen exterior sheathing. Yes, and that that's the most common use right now. And it's, you know, absolutely perfect for that as a rain screen. And that's kind of the, the modern way we're talking about, you know, creating an isolation layer, you know, that um, can take the brunt, you know, of the weather and uh, even leaving open gaps around it. So, yeah, so on the code side, um, that the question coming in about the code, what, is that going to be different in every jurisdiction, or is this pretty generally accepted or pretty generally You know, it, it's really <laughs> fascinating. What, we, yeah, what we've what we been doing on the plans is we, you know, manufacture approved structurally rated fiber cement board. Now, what that invokes with every building department in America is, you know, the things that have been written up pertaining to Hardy Board. And Hardy Board, every code book now requires the four by eight sheets of hardy board when used as a sheeting to have a full backer sheet like three three eighths, you know, OSB or plywood plus Tyvek because everybody knows, you know, hardy board gets wet and it holds moisture. We can mm -hmm. prove and we have to dozens of building departments that this board does not hold moisture and is fully structural. So it is a different animal. So we just label it, uh, you know, a manufacturer approved, and that means ASTM stamps approve all of this, the approved fiber, structural fiber cement board. So it arrives white instead of gray, and most times there's no other questions asked because they can look it up, you know, that it has all these ratings. So it is a very, very different animal than hardy board. It's actually exactly what Hardy Board wished it was, structural, non-toxic, and self-dehydrating, which, you know, Hardy Board scores extremely low on what happens after it gets wet. It stays wet, just like plywood and OSB for weeks instead of hours. A, a soaked piece of MGO board self-dehydrates within hours instead of weeks and even months. 
you know, we always ask our clients to just simply take a chunk of drywall of plywood, OSB, soak them in water, set them on your desk and time them. You know, all three will be damp two weeks later. And of course, mold can form within 48 hours. So it's, it's just imperative that we get these materials that know what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah, and um, can it be left unfinished? Yes, we have had clients just fully leave it unfinished, but we highly recommend these coatings because they amplify how quickly the surface can get moisture off of itself and return the board into being a full insulator. By the way, all the ratings you see for fiberglass insulation and all these building materials is under ideal, you know, non-moisture conditions and all of them are damp always, meaning they don't perform anywhere near the rated values. And in fact, the big joke about fiberglass insulation is that it's tested under conditions where you don't need insulation. Perfect humidity, perfect temperatures, and of course, none of that exists in the real world, especially when you combine non-breathing materials on your building envelope, and they're all trapping moisture. How do the uh, lateral structural values compare to plywood and OSB? Extremely close. In fact, it's comparable, almost identical to OSB, and slightly lower in most categories, not all categories, to plywood. So we, we provide those charts. And what we've done in cases where, you know, the building department is arguing, okay, you know, this is 10% or whatever lower than plywood, and we don't want to go to the expensive, thicker versions because they weigh too much and they cost too much. We simply um, put metal strapping for, you know, $50 worth of metal strapping. You can actually achieve the full, you know, um, pencil strength that you need on the outside of your building shell without cheating, simply by putting diagonal pieces of inch and a half wide plumbing tape in strategic locations. So oftentimes if there's any argument with the building department, we'll simply strap the corners at 45 degrees, create all the rigidity even before the sheeting goes on, and then we can prove that our contribution with the board is as high as OSB, but not quite as high as plywood. However, when you sheet both sides of your wall with this material that's, you know, only 10 to 12 percent less than plywood, in terms of, um, you know, nail, screw, and um, staple hold capacity, you're actually, you know, far, far behind a combination of plywood on one side and drywall, which is absolute zero on the other side, or hardy board on one side. And, and in fact, you can't just put hardy board alone on any, any one side of your building. It has, you know, zero structural. So it's way, way beyond, you know, it's a full structural mm -hmm. version of fiber cement board. Mm -hmm. well, can you um, describe how it is anchored? What fasteners are needed? And does it need to be yes. drilled? Yes, and it is a highly alkaline board like Hardy board. So they do need to be alkaline resistant. And again, the chart I send out to folks, you know, shows where we can buy these and self-tapping, you know, on both ends. So it sinks in a sixteenth of an inch. And um, we get them for less than uh, two tenths of a cent each. So, you know, it's not a, a financial loss at all. But we do recommend the screws because all the testing charts you know, you'll see on this material were done with screws, typically six inch on center on the edges and eight inch on center in the field areas, you know, in the middle of the board. So it's, uh, you know, extremely conventional that way. We have quite a few clients, so that are using all stainless steel staples and in some cases even ring shank, you know, stainless uh, nails, you know, mainly as a time saver. Because we do have near identical screw, nail, and staple hole capacity per thickness as uh, OSB board, which has been approved, you know, way beyond what it should have been approved. But, uh, you know, the real, real strength of the building enhancement comes in when you sheet both sides of your wall. Now, non-structural versions of MGO board are in the works, and we had a group out of New York that was making it for quite a while that are now, you know, moving their entire facility to uh, California. 
and they claim they have pre-orders for the next two years, because, you know, they're going to, you know, that'll be a sheet comparable in price to, like, Den's glass, you know, like the $10, $12 sheet, where the structural, you know, common versions of this stuff are closer to, you know, like $25 a sheet, which is, again, you know, very comparable to the exterior grade versions of Hardy Board. And, of course, you know, structural plywoods right up in that category. Can't compete with regular drywall pricing and or OSB pricing at this point. But, again, you know, this is a material that um, can become finished at far, far lower cost than either or any of those materials. It, you know, the vast majority of folks using it simply uh, go with uh, smooth wall. You know, they fully sand out that seam, and the board is, you know, perfectly smooth, perfectly white, so it's perfect base for these, uh, you know, paints and or full finishes. And then, okay. So, oh, we got another uh, question. George, down uh, real, sorry, real oh, yeah. quick here. Um, we we're at our time right now, but we got a lot of questions. A lot of people looks like maybe want to stick around. So I don't want to make anyone sure. who's got to get going uh, stay here. So, George, are you willing to stick around a little bit longer and ask answer some more questions? Yeah, that'll work out yeah. fine. Perfect. So for those of you who do got to get going, um, please don't feel like you got to stay here. There's going to be, uh, you're, you're all going to be good to go for your CUs. I'm going to be getting you your GBCI number here uh, right now in the chat box. Um, but before you go, uh, again, thanks for um, joining us here. Um, and George, just while we're um, kind of closing off before we do some more questions, um, maybe you can just repeat where people can find out some more information about uh, you and about where they can uh, learn about other resources. Yeah, the two main sources, of course, are our website, the geoswan, G-E-O-S-W-A-N.com, and then the, uh, the whole website just on the book itself, just breathing walls, and that is plural, dot com. And uh, we give away several chapters of the book, and the, the book is, it was written for, you know, it has the first, oh, 25% of it is just goes deep into the science of converting moisture into vapor. In other words, setting up a criteria for competency for a building material. And then we go into the, you know, the ones that are available, the breathing materials that are available in North America. So a good 20% of the book is just on these clay and magnesium treated wood chip blocks, you know, Duracell and Baswall. And that's what we see on the cover is a typical wall section from those, you know, typically foot thick blocks. Obviously that's disruptive. There's not a lot of really good brick lane kind of folks, you know, that get involved with residential. For years that's what we concentrated on and, you know, over the years we just got a, you know, really big backlog and people who really needed affordable, non-disruptive ways of creating, you know, a breathing wall technology. So a lot of our focus now has been even on these little mini houses and they're, you know, extremely critical that they be non-toxic and easily have double the amount of wall and ceiling surrounding your tiny footprint in a small, small building and actually have double the exposure <laughs> you would have in a larger building. So it really, really becomes uh, critical, and especially that, you know, we're working with the folks who, many, many folks who have no choice. They simply have to be out of these conventional buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, we got some more questions. And again, before everyone takes off, I do want to give a, a shout out to Oram Miller, who also seems to have joined us here today. Uh, thanks for chiming in. He also helped, as you can see, co-write the book. And Oram's been fantastic. We've worked with him on a series of reducing um, exposure to EMFs in the new construction remodeling process. Um, and so we've referenced EMFs a little bit, but if you guys want to learn more about problems that EMFs propose, we've got a ton of resources on our website for that on our YouTube. And we've got some more sessions coming up in December, uh, as well as it's built right into our Green Star certification checklist, gives you guidance on how to avoid EMF. Um, issues. And then I also have to say on the MSC, uh, we worked with the, uh, uh, slaughter their name here, but the um, uh, Healthy Design Center out of Wakasha, Wisconsin, 
I might have got that wrong, but we have a whole section on uh, new construction oriented processes to avoid and reduce exposure um, and prevent multiple chemical sensitivities or major allergic or asthmatic attacks on our website as well. And so a lot of great resources out there to learn more about these issues of EMFs or um, multiple chemical sensitivity. So I'm glad you guys brought that up. So we got some more questions here. Please stick around. We got a little more time if everybody wants to get some more of their, their questions answered. The uh, I want to make sure I didn't miss anything here. So the next one I got up, and, and George, maybe you hinted at this a little bit, but I just want to make sure we don't miss anything. Um, can you explain more about the concept of complete vapor open wall assemblies and how we can install this under the current building code? Uh, that is IRC 2015 uh, that requires a class one vapor retarder? Yes, yes. And that, that term vapor retarder is, you know, uh, a, a great transition term because when you really study what a vapor retarder is, it's actually adding a breathing layer. <laughs> In other words, the full acknowledgement that the modern materials we commonly use simply don't work by themselves. And we call them the green building band-aids. And they're, they're way better than not doing it, you know. Basically, the crinkle mats, the things like Vapro that are actually like tiny little straws with felt on each side, they will definitely prolong the life of those materials. Uh, we, we have, you know, obviously an argument about you still have poison behind your wall, but you've given it a release valve, and that's what a rain screen can do as well. And to do it, economically without actually adding, you know, full gaps between the materials. So whenever, you know, we're in this situation where, you know, a vapor retarder is required, most of them are, are quite breathable now. You know, the, the, nobody uses the term vapor barrier. <laughs> you know, to the great credit of the city of Austin, they were the first building department in America to ban the vapor barrier on walls. They still have them on floors and we have a lot of argument with that, you know, on slabs and all that. But a huge amount of progress has been made. The building science people fully acknowledge this, but they have to deal with a mindset that feels like the non-breathing moisture trapping materials are permanent. And yes, the band-aids are extremely helpful. You know, if you can get a 30-second inch breathing between two non-breathing materials, like plywood and drywall and everything else we're throwing in the wall, uh, yes, the performance of that building will increase. So we actually want to use that as almost a handle. They really are talking about breathing walls. They just haven't gotten to the point of using the right terms yet. <laughs> but what it does is when you fully understand what a vapor retarder is doing, you know, it means it's trying to control the vapor rate. It's doing it by adding a small amount of breathing to the assembly. So, you know, we don't want to demean the green building programs, but they truly are, you know, green band-aid programs, built dealing with materials that fundamentally don't work by themselves. And that's really the big upshot of what every green building program is doing in America saying, okay, you know, we think we're stuck with these materials permanently. Here's the Band-Aid you can put on it to, you know, suck a few extra years out of it. Now, for the highly chemically sensitive, that's not good enough. Obviously, the wall's still poisonous. But poisons tend to emit much, much faster when things are damp. And, of course, you know, that's right at the core of indoor quality issues are, you know, trapped moisture in walls. Um, and there was a real quick follow-up to that. Um, all right, but how does a breathing wall address dew point and vapor drive in a climate zone five specifically? Right, right. And we have built these, uh, the FAS wall type construction we've done in Alaska, Hawaii, um, quite a few in China, uh, huge entire villages in Japan are made with this, this you know, clay, magnesium, wood chip technology, you know, block form. So there is a long history of using this in extreme climates. Uh, yes, they all have extreme dew point issues and vapor driving, and basically it becomes a free rolling wall. You can't control, you can't guess where your dew point's going to be. 
It actually changes from hour to hour as the sun is tracking around the building. And every guess that we make turns out wrong. <laughs> it bleeds under certain conditions where you never, ever expect it. So, yes, you must get it out, ideally electromagnetically through the push-pull pulp charges of cellulose next to clay. And that's the deep wisdom, you know, of strong clay buildings, mm -hmm. which have been built in every climate on Earth. Uh, I want to. There's a couple more technical questions, but I wanted to jump into one on uh, delivery. Obviously, the you know the question is getting access to these materials if somebody really wanted to take the next step. So, what is the typical lead time for delivery of the fiberboard material? Are they stocked by distributors in the U.S. or are all imported overseas on a project-specific basis? Right. Yeah. Luckily, there's. You know, one of the groups I work with have six different designated warehouses throughout the U.S. that has really, really helped reduce the shipping costs, and they ship within four or five days. And, you know, I, you know, and again, when I send out things, I can, you know, mention all the product names. But they're, they're all groups using basically the same ancient formulas out of China that, um, you know, are making this board available in typically in pallet sizes of like 30, anywhere from 25 to 65 sheets per pallet, depending on the thickness, you know, three quarters all the way down to one quarter. And those common four by eight sizes that are stocked in America are like quarter inch, three eighths, seven sixteenths, half inch, and three quarter inch. And yes, we can generally get those to people, you know, within five or six days. Now, for larger projects where we do full containers, you can expect, you know, full 15 to 20 percent savings, but a full seven to nine week delivery time directly out of Asia. And our primary Asian supplier is the same group that supplies to Dragon Board or, you know, the common one here in America. But, um, you know, at far, far better pricing and but you do have the long delay, um, you know, filling a full container. And, you know, some of the projects are multiple containers and there's even higher saving potential. The good news is we can usually get it in delivery, you know, between five and ten working days in the U.S. in almost all locations because the warehouses, you know, are spread evenly throughout the U.S. In total, there's about 12 uh, stocking distributors for the various different brands of MGO board in America. And I've used, you know, six different brands, you know, from six suppliers over the years and, you know, I've kind of narrowed it down to two or three that we use constantly, you know, that have the best consistency of product. And the biggest danger of all is ordering directly from China. We always point out there's seven grades of MGO in China. And one of the most common uses is simply wrapping concrete beams with it to give them fire ratings. And that version, you know, has zero waterproofing, ragged edges, is the equivalent of like $4 a sheet. <laughs> and the only stuff we bring into America, even in China, is equivalent to like 16 a sheet. And by the time we ship it here, you know, retails for right around 25 to $30 a sheet. Mm -hmm. Which, is there, by um... the way, they, yeah. Right. Oh, go ahead. No, hardy board, exterior grade, eight millimeter, three eighths inch hardy board at Home Depot. It's thirty one dollars a sheet now, so this is extremely competitive. You know, and it's non structural, non everything, and requires sheeting behind it. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there any uh, MGO filler for nail head slash finish, nail slash screws? Yes, yes. For years, we used only magnesium blends for the joint compound, but it was so builder unfriendly. It was so hard to grind afterwards that we've gone to these um, uh, these uh, other alternative non-Portland cement compatible joint compounds. And because I'm not affiliated with the company, I can mention, you know, that is all uh, the uh, rapid set products, you know, which is the fastest growing concrete company in America, all non-Portland cement mineral blends, fantastic materials. 
showing, you know, how the world trend, you know, definitely is moving away from Portland. <laughs> And they're right out and, of California, a really great group. And the last question we have, uh, I think, is a follow-up on the dialogue we've been having about uh, the code and the dew points and the vapor drive. And then and, and, and okay. I got to this, forgive me, but it does, says, so then the idea is hydric, um, hydric buffering as opposed to vapor dew point control. Okay, right. Yeah, the materials that know how to give off their, their moisture electro electromagnetically. In other words, this works no matter how cold, no matter how hot, no matter what. <laughs> it's an electromagnetic exchange the same way your bone next to tissue is giving off moisture almost under any condition exterior to it. So it's a very, it's like internally, you know, balancing these things instead of trying to get external, um, well, we call them band-aids, you know, trying to deal with the, what we feel is the incompetence of the materials themselves. Because, you know, we've never set up this criteria for a building's ability to get moisture off itself, which should be, you know, primary. All right, George. Well, I I definitely appreciate your time today. Thanks for everyone who's joining us. It looks like uh, those are all the questions we have. Um, again, my name is Brett Little, Executive Director at the Green Home Institute. Keep up with us uh, weekly at our free webinar series or check out more information at our website on greenhomeinstitute.org to watch a recording of this session or um, check out other uh, sessions we've been doing. And, um, you know, make sure to go to geoswan.com or breathingwalls.com to get more information on breathable walls. So thank you, George. Okay. Uh, take care. Oh. Okay. Well, we did have one more question. Do you want me to Oh, yeah, please. One? Please. I just saw yeah, it come yeah. through. So let's, the one let's about, it right. Yeah. Would we run into condensation at some point in the open wall? And, and yes, of course, there'll be moisture in the wall. The issue will be how long will it hang out? Mm -hmm. And yes, it literally will instantly convert it into vapor. So yeah, it all comes down to this lag. And of course, when we talk about, you know, vapor retarders, what we're hoping to do is to retard the rate of exchange of moisture inside the wall to where it can't do damage. The trouble is that's all it's doing. It's not fully hydrating the wall and leaving it in a competent position to insulate and protect you electromagnetically. You know, wet things conduct like mad. <laughs> but it does protect the wall from, you know, the, the dripping water inside the wall. So, you know, in a very real sense, we like to think of all the things that are going on with, you know, the, the band-aids as a precursor to why we need breathing walls, why we, you know, someday want to go beyond the band-aid into what actually will last over time and address our moisture issues. Oh, still there? Yep, I was just seeing if any more uh, questions were to were to were to slip in here. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out here. But if another one does pop up, um, we can definitely yeah, grab just it send it out. over. You can email. Oh, the yeah. other thing is, I would like to. Well, my email address, of course, is you know uh, right on the website. But it is okay. um, just my name two four five at yahoo dot com. And feel okay. free to. You know, send in email questions in. Okay. Great. Appreciate the, Thank you, the chance. Yep. Be with you guys. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Goodbye.